Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and today we have two very special guests. We have writer and star Dana Abraham and director Ruzbe Hidari from the movie Neon Lights that is premiering today, that is July 12th, today on digital and on demand. So guys, welcome to the show. How are you both doing? I'm feeling great. Thanks for having us today. Uh, Thank you so much for having us. It's my pleasure. And like I told you just before we went live, uh, this movie is phenomenal. I loved it. Um, several of my team members, have, they saw it twice, you know, just to really get the grasp of it. And I think people are going to find themselves seeing this more than one time. So let's get right to it. Now, Dana, you wrote the script and you're the, <clears throat> you're the leading star. You play Clay. Was it difficult for you to keep your priorities clear, having to wear so many different hats for this project? Oh, well, I mean, how much time do you got for me to explain that? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> no, you know what? It, it's, it's extremely challenging. Um, then you couple in the factors of that we were filming during the height of the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I have such a great team. Bruce Bay is so brilliant when it comes to man, uh, manning the um, creative aspects of this um, film so that's what you get to see mm -hmm. and he's just my creative partner and, and from the inception of the script and how we were able to distill it and uh, make it uh, really efficient and and work within the requirement of you know making sure the risks were limited during the second wave um, we were able to execute pretty properly and uh, I, I was able to manage my expectation and priorities uh, seamlessly throughout as much as I could anyway you know as they say it's never easy so no. you just got to get through it you know absolutely now Ruse Bay uh, first of all how long have you and Dana mm -hmm. known each other and were you on board with this film when uh, mm -hmm. the writing started or did you have to be convinced to be brought on board and direct this uh, well, I've known Dana just uh, since the beginning of this pandemic, but it okay. feels like I've known him for uh, 100 lifetimes, which is kind of special. Um, when we met, uh, we needed to make a film together. We were just, you know, so gung ho about working together and, and really wanted to push that. And Dana had had the makings of a script already called me on mics. And then I brought a bunch of ideas out of left field and he tried to make sense out of them, including his own creative genius, and, and uh, the script was born. Now, Dana, uh, like we talked about, this is a very complicated film that has a lot of different layers. When you were writing the screenplay, what would you say was some of the biggest challenges that you, you were faced with? Well, you know, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, first and foremost, I think the biggest uh, issue that we had was how do we make a movie during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Because we had to be very mindful of uh, casting choices. We had to be very mindful of how to make a psychological thriller with such severe limitations. And so my original script for Neon Lights, it was a really large show. There, it's something that we couldn't have accomplished during the pandemic period. So, uh, you know, we had to just figure out solutions to every issue. Mm -hmm. So when it came down to cast, we had to figure out ways to utilize the limited cast in a way in which we could tell a story that led to complications. And, but, you know, the, the one thing that Ruse and I really agreed upon was that we didn't want to make it a lukewarm or an easy to watch film. The theme of it is mental health. And the theme of it continuously happens to be financial familial failure, childhood trauma, all of those situations and, and the thematic, uh, you know, issues were really relevant at the time. Oh, yeah. And so to make a movie of that nature, in and of itself, it's going to be complicated. And we know that any, we, we both agreed that if people didn't appreciate it, it's because they might have not gotten the idea of what's actually happening. It's a very cerebral thriller. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we wanted them to rewatch it. Almost like a, a Christopher Nolan Inception type of thing. You just have to kind of watch it, let it marinate, go back to it. Exactly. And uh, that's where we really wanted to live with this film. And I'm just so proud of my partner here, Ruse. He just, he, he crushed the days, never went into overtime. We did it, you know, safely. Nobody got COVID on set. And, you know, we're just really proud of this film. And uh, that's that's all I really have to say on that. Now, Ruse Bay, and, uh, I got to ask you, uh, when you saw the script, when you are the story, you guys both helped in with the story. 
uh, did you find yourself asking, how am I going to present such a, uh, a complicated story, a complicated script to the viewers where it leaves them guessing, wanting to come back again for some more, but yet accurately and properly tell the story? Yeah, well, when you're telling a story that that central theme is uh, mental health and sort of the breaking down of mental health, uh, A, you don't want to be exploitative about it. Yeah. Uh, so I did my, you know, I did my research. We reached out to therapists and practitioners at the University of Toronto, even and people I've worked with in my life and, you know, really tried to digest uh, the feel and, and the, the essence of it as truthfully as, as possible. And, you know, when, when you're going through those motions um, that Clay is, the dots don't always connect. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of this movie. Um, you know what I mean? Is, yeah. is what Clay is going through. The, and, and how do you embody that now visually? Um, you know, and the neon lights uh, for us, for me especially, the, color, the different colors that, that were character traits uh, when you look at someone, when you when you view someone, it is essentially your projection of them is what you're seeing. It's you know what I mean. So yeah. uh, clay is essentially projecting, uh, and the different colors represent different characteristics and traits, memories, um, and whatnot. So absolutely, uh, a lot of prep went into it. You know, <laughs> we spent a long time preparing just just to ha how to attack it, and then and then. You know, we shot it in 15 days, so we just really had to do the preps to be able to, you know, cohesively shoot it in that. Now, of time. The movie has a very dark feel to it with sort of like the bright lights behind it. But where the characters are placed, uh, it's, a, it's a very dark uh, setting. Uh, Ruzba, it was that part of the plan? Did you and Dana work together to work up the lighting to have that effect. Uh, walk us through that. Um, well, you know, in, when you look at something visual, um, it's it's the contrast that makes it, you know, the contrast in the tones, the contrast in the colors, and the light temperatures, you know, that's what makes a, an image pop. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of it, I do have to, uh, you know, credit Dimitri Lopez, our amazing cinematographer who tirelessly you know we him and i would go to that location so often before we even started shooting and he was just trying to wrap his head on how because i was like these are the colors these are the characters this is what they have to embody mm -hmm. so he he really dedicated himself in trying to figure out how to light these rooms um so so that it would work and it doesn't look off or you know jarring but but that it, it just kind of becomes part of the house and it's as if the house is kind of bleeding all these traits and colors and feels right like it, you kind of wanted to give it give it that kind of a vibe like the house is just infused and it that's the blood of the house it definitely worked dana would you say uh the lighting that Ruzbe was just talking about is sort of like a peek inside clay's mind as well for sure. Um, actually, that I, I would credit that heavily to Ruse because when I had originally written it, it's because I, I was going through the state of New York and I stumbled into this really small town that was really ominous. That's where I got the idea for Neon Lights. But the Neon Lights came from because I was walking through a carnival and they had all these Neon Lights going on. Wow. Um, Ruse Bay, because he's so cerebral, he's such an intellect, he wanted to use color association with the mental psyche and how certain colors are, are dependent on mood, personality traits, and vision. So there's, I'm gonna let him finish this part because when I had met him and we're talking about this project, he, he had right away uh, leaned into Edgar Allan Poe mm -hmm. and he had leaned into the Mask of the Red Death. Now I wasn't well versed in Edgar Allan Poe at that specific time, so I didn't really understand what he was getting at. And it wasn't until after we finished Neon Lights that I read the book and, and then understood it. but. You know, he had also this idea of what each of the floors in, in the building were for the mind. And so really it just comes down to Ruse's execution and his belief on what made more sense. And, you know, that's why the 
film is so cerebral because yes. you know the script was actually a little bit less complex but that Ruse is just so great at making you think he didn't want you to just know what was going to happen he wanted you to think about what was going to happen to keep you engaged yeah. we had two two premieres one in in, in my hometown hamilton uh over 600 people and you know i stood all the way in the back because i was really scared and <laughs> nobody was on their phones because you couldn't be because you had to be engaged and I, i'm sure you can attest that oh, and that yeah. goes to ruse bay's ability to keep you focused and engaged. So i'll let you finish ruse bay why why you what, the three floors can you explain that because I, yeah, I don't want to for you i mean uh you know the three levels of your psyche you know uh the super ego the ego the it mm -hmm. and you know, we sort of even down to the shooting style, the way that the, the images were captured, uh, technically were different on each of the floors. Um, you know what I mean? So yeah. if you pay attention, you'll, you'll, you know, and, and again, I can, Dana attributes that to me, but I can attribute all of that to Alfred Hitchcock, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you, when you see his films, that he does that, you know, with, within the, within the, uh, locations and, and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, call it overthinking, but I, I just get engaged with uh, the words that were on the page and, and you know, try to, to bring them to life in, in my own way. Absolutely. Now, Dana, what would you say was the inspiration, the, the foundation for Neon Lights? Uh, was it just to tackle mental illness? Was it a little bit more than that? What was it? Um, in about 2018, I, I made a short film that really gave me an opportunity to then go make features and be put in the rooms to pitch. Um, it was called Prisoner of Fear, and it was about mental health. It's uh, something that I've dealt with for a really long time. I, know Ru, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, he's dealt with for a long time. And um, it's a day-to-day -day battle. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, you know, we're trying to navigate through so much rough terrain, and, and, you know, we're inundated with information and and just media and so many different things that doesn't actually help, but actually just inflames those issues. And so for us, when the pandemic had started, I really hit a low point in March because I had just finished Maternal, our first film at Red Hill Entertainment, uh, my production company, and all of a sudden everything just stopped. And I was feeling the pressures of society, just like everybody else. And, yeah. and so Neon Lights, I really, really leaned into mental health as much as I could because you know, at the end of the day, we wanted to tell a story and, and send a message. Mm -hmm. um, but then we masked it with a thriller in order to entertain our audience the best that we can. So that way, you know, you get the best bang for your buck. I can personally it, relate. And let me tell you why. The reason why I started doing this show is because I was in a severe state of OCD, mm -hmm. you know, which is anxiety. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. seeing a doctor only brought me back 60% of the way and I needed to find a purpose and a meaning. And I started doing this show and this brought wow. me all the way back. And mental illness, it's not something that goes away. It's something you have to learn how to control. Uh, and and, and I'm sorry, to cut, sorry to cut you off, but I think we, we say that in the film too, that the healing never ends. Like, I don't want to give away what's, yeah. but you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like the, the, the journey of healing is a day-to-day -day thing. And it's it always on. there. It's always there. It'll never just go away with some, you absolutely, know, absolutely. Now, Dana, ocean or... Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Uh, Dana, now you are the star of the movie as well. Clay, we said that already. Uh, you mentioned earlier the uh, challenges you faced with COVID. Was it always your intention to play Clay or was it a necessity because of COVID? Um, to be honest with you... Uh, as, as a performer, I've just really struggled to book a role. Uh, I'll, I'll just say I'm terrible at auditions. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I, I wrote the film with the intention of playing Clay, but I've written several other films with the intention of playing the lead role. And, you know, it's such a difficult and volatile industry to get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, as we went into the financial rounds and trying to attach the talent and, and move forward, there's been several times where I had self-doubt one, because I didn't have the level of experience to be able to play such a complex character and to be able to execute. That confidence was wavering. Mm -hmm. But it was actually, again, to go back, it's Ruse Bay, because I remember one day specifically, I had mentioned to him that somebody's really interested, somebody with a name was really interested in playing this character and would do it at the financial means that we had. Um, and he said, no, like, I won't do this movie if you're not the lead. And, and then from that point forward, I just stuck with it. And we really started working on that character, like, 
mid July where I started figuring out what what he should look like and how he should behave. And Ruzbe got me in touch with psychotherapists and we really started talking about the minutiae to be able to execute how schizophrenia works at a certain degree mm -hmm. and not just being, you know, lukewarm with it and just really pinpointing, targeting those behaviors. Because I didn't want to be a comic book character for individuals that do suffer from those illnesses because yeah. that's that's just disingenuous and a disservice. So Again, it comes back to Ruse. Uh, I, I really couldn't have done it without him. He's my best friend. And, and we've done another movie since then. We're on a third now. And um, so I'm just a blessed young man to have had him by my side. You sure. guys sound like a great team. Ruse Bay, there's a scene in the movie, uh, the family dinner, where you did this beautifully. The camera sort of pans around the whole table as they're sitting down. Uh, how was that idea conceived by you um and did you struggle with it did you <laughs> did you say man is this really what i want to do walk us through that do you want the like do you want the dreamy romanticized answer or do you the want truth. the truth oh man i'll tell you, you i was like i want to finish truths. up <laughs> there's two truths there's two truths Let's hear first it. of all the idea came about because of the uh the dialogue in the movie that keeps haunting clay Right, round and round and round and round and round and round you go. And I was like, what What a better scene uh, to do that round and round uh, visually. Yeah. Uh, when he's just going around in circles as he has been with, with, with the family. But also, try shooting a six-hander. Like, it's, it'll take all day. Yeah. So you put the thing on a dolly. You put the camera on a dolly and around and around you go. And... And it let, lets the actors really live in the moment. Uh -huh. And we don't have to keep doing like a hundred takes from each angle to get the coverage. It's just you one just, long know. shot. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did it a few times. And these, these guys were so good that like, literally, I'm like, after three, four takes of it, I was like, all right, now maybe just switch a lens for a take. And, and our first AD had scheduled seven hours for that scene because it's 11 pages of the script. Yeah. And you know he was expecting that we shot that in what three hours maybe? yeah but may, may i add to that mm -hmm. uh on, on again I, I mean you're probably like yo these guys are bromancing like all they do is talk about each other. but you know ruse no matter how people feel about this film i want people to understand that there's no i have never i've worked with two directors before i got to ruse bay i've done other films under my banner mm -hmm. no and they're phenomenal as well but ruse he would make floor plans and and measure out the dimensions so he knew exactly where that dolly would needed to go and what the camera angles would be. He was so efficient and thoughtful with his choices on what he wanted to capture because he envisioned what the movie should look like yeah. from his editing background that everything was seamless when we shot it. Wow. So regardless of how you feel about the film and the complexities and the difficulties of maybe understanding it the one thing people should take away is this guy came in shot during the second wave of the pandemic in 15 days because insurance wouldn't allow us to go past that mm -hmm. with a limited crew limited cast and he gave you something that's very meaningful Absolutely. and you cannot do that unless you are excellent at what you do he eats sleep breathes directing he i've seen him work I, i've never seen anything like it and uh you know at the end of the day what you see is is what he put together. He, he really worked his tail off for this. I completely agree. You cannot walk away from watching this film and not notice the image, the imagery, the cinematography that you guys did. Now, Dana, uh, when it came time, you mentioned this earlier, when it came time to play Clay, you mentioned schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. uh, did you approach this uh, from the angle that Clay is schizophrenic? or suffering from severe childhood trauma and and that excellent question so um when i when we wrote this script we had originally thought okay he's schizophrenic but when we then spoke to the psychotherapist she said he has elements of schizophrenia but it actually comes down from his disassociative behavior yeah. from his childhood trauma and that again then ties into the coloring the disassociation from colors, patterns, and his OCD. And I mean, you, you must understand his yeah. behavior because you, you know, you get it. Exactly. And um, so again, to answer your question uh, uh, carefully, it's that it is about his childhood trauma with elements of schizophrenia because of his disassociative behavior. Okay. Okay. That yeah. And also, 
if I could add to that, uh, ext- extreme trauma triggers that uh, as well. The it's DID, cute. absolutely. Yeah. Now, we got to mention Kim Coates as Denver's. <laughs> he was phenomenal. Uh, yeah. And that is going to be, we don't want to give away any spoilers. Uh, his character is going to be the biggest question mark when people leave uh, are done watching this film. I, like I said, I don't want to give away any spoilers, so I'm trying to watch my words very carefully. But what did he do? What is real? What is not real? What was just in Clay's head? What actually happened? Uh, you know, bo- any of you guys can answer this. Was that the intent? <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I'll was, take that. Was that the yeah. intent of the script yeah. and the film? Well, the goal was to, again, keep you in your seats and questioning everything. Yeah. So when it came to Denver, the character that Kim played, whether he's real or in the mind, or it, we didn't want to really give you an answer because our goal was to figure out for yourself what is real and what's not. Mm-hmm. Because then it becomes an inward reflection of mirroring your own thoughts. Are your thoughts real? Are they projections? Or are they a real person that give you those issues that you have? Is, is it your father? Is it your significant other? Things we were facing in real time during the pandemic when we were locked up in our home. Or is it our own thoughts that are giving us a negative you know, energy, the negative thought mm-hmm. processes? So again, we, again, to not give away spoilers, um, we just wanted the audience to dictate what it is that Denver meant to them. Okay, that's yeah. and also per- perception is everything, right? Yeah. If, if 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 you see it, it is. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Now the film Ruse Bay, the film ends with an Edgar Allan uh, Poe quote. Now Dana said he didn't actually read uh, the book until afterwards, but so I'm assuming that quote was your idea. Is that correct or incorrect? Uh, I mean, we were we had a few we had a few going on there, but I mean, uh, I don't want to give away the quote either because it's a bit of a spoiler. But mm-hmm. that seemed to be just so appropriate, yeah. right? That one, it, was. it just seemed to sum it all up. So uh, I gotta we tell you, like, oh, sorry, I, and I think I think that was actually Dana's idea, <laughs> right? Because after we had finished post on the film, is when he started reading Poe. And we had another quote in there, and then he comes up to me. And the film is like, it's cut, it's edited, but we're just like finding, finishing it up, packaging it, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And he and he's like, "Hey, Ruse, what, what about this this quote instead of the one?" Wait, we but have do you know why, Ruse? I, I said that because he bought himself a sweater and he gifted me a T-shirt, and it was Edgar Allan Poe at the front. And he had the quote on the back, but this was before we went to camera. Wow. Originally, I had Aristotle in there. And oh. then, and because um, you know, it's 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 a thriller, but it's still very artistic. Oh, and yeah. so absolutely. And so, I had <laughs> come to him and I started reading Edgar Allan Poe, and I was like, "Oh my goodness! Like this makes so much more sense." And the shirt makes so much. Fun. Like, this guy's weird. Why is he giving me the shirt? Like it's <laughs> like really dark, you know. And uh, and so the quote was on the back of the shirt. I'm like, "Bruce, this is the one, man. We got to put this at the end." Absolutely. Uh, we're pretty much out of time. I want to ask, I want both of you to answer. When yeah. people watch this film, we know it's about mental illness, but what is the one takeaway that you hope people get when they watch it? Let's start with uh, Rouge Bay. Honestly, just to uh, evoke question, that's it. As long as, as long as someone watches it and they question something, my job is done. Uh, that, that's absolutely correct. How about you, Dana? Life is a day-to-day battle. Just take it one day at a time. You'll be just fine. Absolutely. Guys, again, the movie is called Neon Light. It's available as of today on digital and video on demand on your platform of choice. Check it out. Uh, I suggest instead of renting, you buy it because you're going to probably want to see it at least two times to really get everything that you might have missed the first time around. This is an amazing film. Again, congratulations to the both of you. Uh, The way you described the COVID conditions, the restrictions, the limited cast and crew, you guys did an amazing job. So again, congratulations. I think the film is gonna be a big success. Do you have any final thoughts you wanna share before we go? 
No, I'll be back on your show for the next couple of films. I'll see you soon. Uh, absolutely. I, I love your shirt. <laughs> Christine. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you guys so much. I want to thank, thank you, man. our live Cheers. audience and those of you who will be watching this after we're done with the live. Thank you again to Dana Abraham and Ruzbe Hidari. Uh, the movie, again, is called Neon Lights. Make sure to check it out. On behalf of Ruzbe and Dana, guys, stay safe and stay walking. Good night, everybody.